Okay, so welcome everyone. This is a uh, evening program of Los Angeles Audubon Society. It's uh, January 11th, 2023, a happy new year um, to everyone. Uh, appreciate you coming out for this talk um, uh, tonight. Uh, if you uh, found out from our newsletter, that's great, or our mailing list. Um, if you found out some other route and you want to get on our mailing list, of course, go to laaudubon.org. And at the bottom, we have a sign-up form and lets you pick some of the different categories of emails uh, that you might want to uh, receive from us, including our events, uh, our evening programs, um, uh, information about rare birds. Uh, it comes out uh, every every week. And... Uh, ability to get together uh, with people in the field um, uh, for the, the bird walks. And uh, here we get together online uh, for our, our evening programs. So I uh, want to thank and uh, welcome our uh, speaker this evening is uh, Mario Diaz. He is uh, a full professor at the National Museum of Natural Sciences in Madrid, Spain, and he's actually speaking to us um, very early in the morning uh, in Spain, <laughs> um, <laughs> the middle of the night, I would venture to say. And uh, he has uh, been a visitor here in Los Angeles uh, at, at UCLA and has some collaborations with ornithologists here in, in the Americas and is going to talk to us uh, this evening about an upcoming project about um, bird behavior in response to uh, threats. Uh, so I sort of cheekily suggested the title Scaring Birds for Science uh, mm -hmm. because uh, and it's not scaring them too badly, uh, just getting them to getting them to flush. Um, but uh, it is a, a, a rather exciting program and, and is going to draw on uh, volunteer uh, birders uh, across uh, the Americas, as 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 we will hear. So, uh, want to welcome uh, Professor Diaz, and uh, let him uh, take take it away. And we'll take uh, questions uh, at the end. Or I think I have the chat enabled too. And if folks are watching on Facebook, they can put questions and comments in the in the comments there, and we'll we'll catch those uh, and convey them on as we uh, proceed with the discussion tonight. So, welcome Mario, and uh, take it away. Thank you very much. I'll share the screen. Everything okay? Looks great. Okay. Well, uh, good evening. Good morning in my face, in my side. And here is now 4.30 uh, in the morning. But I'm just uh, coming back from the LEA. So my, my schedule is, uh, is, is still a bit, I mean, American rather than, than, than Spanish. Well, my name is Mario Diaz. I work in the Spanish uh, National Museum of, uh, of, um, of Natural Sciences, and I'm very interested in urban bear ecology. I was visiting Dan Blumstein there in the UCLA for the last five months, and we have developed that common project. I have, I'd like to present to us, to everybody, and, and just to to make uh, collaborative work in, 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 this, uh, in this area of urban bear ecology. I, I would like to, to, to thank Travis for giving me the opportunity of presenting this. And with no more introduction, I will start, okay? Uh, yeah. Well, the, the idea behind this uh, project is that <clears throat> animals and birds in, 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 the, in the case of this project uh, shall integrate their uh, requirements of food and reproduction production with uh, uh, the risk of being predated and uh, in, in, in man-managed uh, habitats with the risk of being disturbed by, by people. Uh, this uh, fine-tuned uh, uh, equilibria between needs and risks uh, is integrated uh, uh, through a behavioral trait that is very, very easy to measure and to estimate by everybody, that is the flight initiation distance. Flight initiation distance is the distance at which birds flee when they are approached under, um, by a human under a standardized circumstance. 
So this simple measurement uh, is an estimate of how birds are integrated these needs and um, risks during the daily uh, uh, behavior. Okay. Well, in this paper, <coughs> we analyze this, uh, be, uh, um, analyze how fly initiation distance vary in European birds along a latitudinal gradient from the Arctic Circle to southern Spain, and uh, uh, comparing this behavior in cities uh, where birds are subjected to more uh, human disturbance, and in the rural surroundings of these cities. And we found <clears throat> a clear cut pattern of uh, fly initiation distance, so that distances are smaller inside cities than in the rural surroundings, and they decrease from the southern um, uh, areas, from uh, Mediterranean uh, uh, Europe to the uh, north. And this, pat this pattern of uh, change in, uh, in uh, fly initiation distance was closely related to the abundance of bird predators, both inside and outside cities and along this gradient, so that uh, predators are less abundant inside cities than in their surroundings because they are more scared by people than, uh, than avian prey. And also the abundance decreases northwards in Europe. So that the conclusion of our work is that this um, uh, simple estimate of uh, bird behavior are reflecting both predation risk and the effect of humans on this predation risk. Well, <clears throat> With this, uh, uh, well, we have started several other projects uh, uh, on the basis of these uh, uh, results, but um, the, in this year, we are trying to develop to um, uh, a project just uh, also analyzing latitudinal trends, but uh, uh, including also altitudinal trends in, in, in flight initiation distance using the American continent as a um, natural experiment. Uh, the um, American continent, the western coast, uh, is, uh, is, is a narrow uh, altitudinal gradient between the coast and the high uh, and mountains in the Rockies and in also in the Andes. So we can make um, altitudinal gradients uh, of, uh, of uh, measurements of behavior and replicate these altitudinal gradients from uh, north to south. Uh, the idea of the project is to develop this, uh, this uh, sampling of uh, bird behavior um, uh, in six countries in, in, the, state of, in the United States, uh, Mexico, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Peru, and Chile, and uh, do this uh, sampling um, in, uh, in, in the breeding season of next year and the following one. We are uh, this long list of people <laughs> working in uh, every uh, country and also my, my, my European colleagues. And the idea is to present you this, um, this uh, project, uh, looking for collaboration because uh, uh, we have to do quite a lot uh, of sampling uh, and, and it should be as, sim as more simultaneous as possible. Well, the idea of the project <clears throat> is to select between six and eight cities in each country. Cities should be um, large enough to allow sampling around 400, uh, 500 individual birds within the city and another 400, 500 in the rural surroundings of the city during uh, one breeding season. Uh, this is uh, the cities we have preliminarily selected in the United States. There are cities from sea level, that's uh, San Diego and Los Angeles, which is a height of 2,000 meters above sea level, that is Flagstaff in, in Arizona. And the idea is that uh, in each city and the rural surroundings, one person or two or more person, but coordinated, will sample uh, beer behavior during the breeding season of uh, 2024 and 2025. But anyway, we, we can start this year if people are interested in it. Okay? <clears throat> well, uh, uh, 
this preliminary list of cities is uh, preliminary. I mean, if it, there is no people uh, for something, I mean, Kingman or Las Vegas, we can change the city for another at a similar altitude just to maintain the gradient. Okay? <coughs> well, <coughs> what is the sampling procedure? As you will see, it's very, very simple and very, very, uh, I would say, uh, funny. Well, the idea is just to random, to do random walks around urban and rural areas of, of the, the sampling, I mean, the study area during early mornings in the breeding season, just looking for birds. Uh, uh, the, the, these walks will be more or less the same as we do when, when we are just bird watching. I mean, it's the idea is to ca carry binoculars with neutral clothing and people should sample birds alone, not in groups, walking at low speed, and just bird watching. Okay? The urban areas uh, are defined as, there is an example for Los Angeles in the two pictures below. Urban areas are residential or commercial areas with high density multi story housing, with uh, interspersed with the streets, urban parks, and so on. I see, it's the kind of landscapes one can find inside a city, <clears throat> where the rural areas that will be within one or ten to ten kilometers of the city border uh, of the sampling city are uh, landscapes with mixed of open farmland, forest, and uh, including also suburbs with low density uh, one or two story housing. The picture uh, in the left is uh, the uh, Three People Trail in, in the Los Angeles and shows more or less what will um, these uh, rural areas uh, will look like in, in Los Angeles area. In each uh, city is different, but uh, this is more or less the idea. Well, during random walks, we usually uh, contact birds. The idea is to uh, sample the flight initiation distance of all birds or every bird we, uh, uh, we detect. And this is, will be the procedure. <clears throat> Uh, the idea is to locate uh, birds before they noti they notice us. I mean, uh, it is not uh, if if the bird uh, if we started sampling their behavior uh, uh, when the bird has already noticed it us, the, is, this behavior will be will be biased. I mean, the first thing we have to do is to identify the species six and eight if uh, if possible, and then start approaching them. We'll also work with adult birds uh, that are not in, engaged uh, in, uh, in reproductive activities. I think they are just doing the normal activities of foraging, singing, or just praying or relaxing, um, and not approach neither nesting birds or birds that are scared by another uh, um, situation, I mean, by the presence of a predator or so on. Uh, the standard procedure is, uh, is uh, depicted in the picture below. <clears throat> you have to just approach a bird directly, looking at it at a normal speed, just counting the paces, paces hmm, <coughs> uh, during the approach. Uh, there are three distances that, uh, that can be um, computed from, from this uh, approach. The first is the starting distance, that is the distance between where, uh, uh, when, when we started the approach until the, the point where the bird was uh, initially. Then the second uh, distance is the alert distance, that is uh, the distance uh, uh, from the point in which the bird noticed us and we, um, it is detected with a change in the bird behavior that they started to look at, uh, at us or uh, changing the normal behavior. And the last distance is the flight initiation distance, that is the distance at which the birds flew away, or either flying or jumping, okay? Uh, the distance, the horizontal distance, uh, can be estimated by pacing and um, previously measuring, sorry, uh, the length of our pace, hmm? and the height above ground, if the bird is perched in a tree or in a building, hmm? can be estimated by edge uh, to the nearest meter. With this information, <clears throat> we can uh, estimate the distance that are not just the horizontal distance by the, the this uh, depicted uh, uh, distance in the in the pictures. Uh, this uh, computation is uh, can be done um, 
uh, automatically with a just Excel file. Uh, the idea is to try to sample all the birds detected, just to approach them, but if the bird doesn't flee, because maybe they are very high in a tree or in a building, just not noting that record. I mean, if, if the bird is not scared by our approach, this uh, uh, estimate of behavior doesn't, it, it is not uh, good. I mean. And the other point is to avoid double records of the same individual just by moving to another place after scaring uh, individuals of the same species uh, uh, and sex. I mean, if you have already sampled, I mean, a male uh, American black bear, just moving to another place, trying to uh, uh, scare another individual different from the first one. Okay, <clears throat> uh, to record this uh, uh, information, we have developed an application for mobile phones that is available free uh, in, uh, in the internet. Uh, the only thing you need is to provide us with an email address for authorizing the uh, uh, download of the, of the, um, of the application. Uh, the application has the, um, two very, very interesting uh, 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 characteristics for the project. Uh, the first one is that they automatically georeference and date every uh, uh, observation, okay? And the second one is that uh, the records are stored in the mobile phone and then are automatically uploaded to a um, server, to an internet server in Spain, <coughs> from which I will send you back, uh, if you like it, a part of sharing all the database with, with other um, researchers. The uh, APP, the uh, application, um, asks the, a number of, of, uh, of um, things that I will just briefly explain now. First uh, question is the species, the bird species we are sampling. The, the, the best thing is to use codes uh, um, because you have to be quick to record of this information before the animal flees. I mean, after recording the species, the idea is to uh, record <clears throat> the number of paces uh, of these, uh, these um, three uh, um, uh, epochs of the, of the approach, no? it is uh, already explained it, mm -hmm. and, and uh, also the height uh, above ground of the, of the bird when we start to approach it. Uh, afterwards, the, um, the, the, the application uh, records the date, time, coordinates, uh, and also the precision of the estimates of coordinates, and they ask to, um, uh, it has to, has to include the city or the site uh, we are uh, sampling the bird, and uh, we can um, uh, add information if the coordinates are measured with, with uh, a larger road than 100 meters. Maybe if, if uh, it is not usual in a city, in a, but anyway, this is uh, in case uh, there is a problem with this. <clears throat> Next question are the sex and age of the individual bird, the kind of habitat, whether uh, we are inside a city or in, in the rural surroundings, the flock size, if the individual is not alone, <clears throat> the uh, mode of escape, either flying or jumping, walking or swimming away uh, when we approach them, whether the bird was singing or not when approaches, and also um, an estimate of the disturbance or the local disturbance um, uh, in the place uh, where testing the birds. The number of pedestrian people uh, walking around uh, within 15 meters of the focal bird where we are testing them, and the number of potential predators, if we see any one of them, I mean, if we say cats, foxes, hawks, or whatever, we can notice. Uh, we know that this, uh, this um, circumstance, the local circumstance may affect flight initiation distance, so we can, uh, with this information, we can control statistically for the, these uh, effects, uh, when we analyze all this uh, data. 
uh, the application also asks ask for an estimates of wind on the weather condition, wind score, cloud cover, and temperature. Uh, if if we have these uh, estimates, if we have no no information on this, we, we can leave this uh, open. Any observation we can add, maybe because the composition of the flock, uh, if it is mixed or whether I mean anything we, we, we like to to include. The observer's name that is the only um, uh, obligatory field to be to be uh, filled it. And the pace length, whether what is the, the length of our paces if we measure distance by pacing, or if we use range finders or a, a, another um, measure or device to uh, measure distance, we just uh, put 100 centimeters as a uh, 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 pace length. Well, we have tested this uh, application. This is this is I mean, this is an example of data we have uh, gathered in Los Angeles in this uh, this uh, this autumn. And it well, it, the application is very very uh, easy to 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 work with, and the information it provides is very is. I mean, it's 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 another. I have I have not used application till now. I, before that, I just put the, the data in a in a notebook, and and now this is another plan. I mean, it is this will facilitate uh, the work uh, uh, enormously. <clears throat> well, uh, this is more or less uh, the project. This project is American Gradients project. is based on scaring birds for science. I mean, we will really not scare them, but just. Uh, measure how scared are them by approaching them uh, um, in a standardized uh, uh, condition. Uh, we think that the project will be very useful because this data will help to understand how birds are dealing with changes in climate, food, predation, and human disturbance, and are things of very uh, uh, actuality because of, the, of the, our current circumstances of global change. It is also a collaborative project in which thousands of birders and researchers will collaborate and sample um, simultaneously hundreds of birds of many species along geographical gradients, and this provides opportunities for collaborating with other research around the world. And this is my more personal experience as, as birder. It is very easy, very pleasant just to look at birds during early mornings. It is funny because you, as you are forced to look very, very carefully at birds, you discover lo lots of things you, you just not, not notice when just looking at, at, at just bird watching. And as many colleagues say, it, it, it can be even addictive. I mean, when you started to, to flush birds for, for this um, project, you, you cannot stop. I mean, <laughs> when, when, the, when the season ends, you, I mean, uh, uh, you, well, like to move to another place to, to, to sample uh, a bird behavior in, in other places. And that's all uh, I, I would like to, to, to show you. I hope you, you will join this uh, collaborative project. You'll enjoy sampling and, and collaborating with other people. And hopefully, will start a more or less long-term uh, collaboration. Uh, muchas gracias. Thank you very much for your attention. And I, of course, open to any question now or through my email just to develop or, or, or any question uh, will, will be interesting uh, for, for any of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so maybe uh, you will put, before we go, put your email in the chat so that everybody has that, so they can get in touch with you if they're interested in, in participating. Um, we'll obviously uh, take uh, questions here. I, I wanted to start a little bit and um, ask if you could talk about what you found relative to um, the flight initiation distance, the, the how skittish the birds are, uh, and uh, some of the work you've done 
in urban areas in uh, in Spain relative to predators? Hmm. Well, the uh, we have we have the, the the paper I showed you is uh, is uh, this more or less starting project about how we we, you, we use how the behavior of bird changes in space hmm, as a more or less natural experiment with which factors are are um, are shaping this behavior and we found that the abundance of natural predators were very important there is a, a clear association between abundance uh, of predators and and um, scare behavior of birds all over europe um, uh, within cities um, the idea is that there are less natural predators than outside cities because predators bird predators uh, are more scared by people hmm, that they prey uh, we are also uh, working now with uh, um, predators that are much more difficult to detect while sampling in urban areas, but that are very important. It is are the feral cats. We have started to work with feral cats uh, in Spain, just uh, comparing the bird behavior in areas where there are plenty of, of these cats, as compared with areas <coughs> with no cats or, or few cats, and we have found um, uh, also an effect of, of cat abundance uh, on bird behavior. Uh, in fact, we are trying not to, to do more or less the same in, in Los Angeles the, this, this spring, um, using data on the distribution of cats taken from, I mean, independent sources uh, of the, um, apart from the, the bird sampling. I mean, if you know uh, if there are cats around, you can you can have a biased uh, estimation of uh, of fly initiation distance, um, but fortunately we have well you know you know Travis you, you have the data on the distribution of cats in Los Angeles. We have also a very good map of the distribution of cats in in, in Madrid in Spain, and we are uh, developing a, a similar map for Toledo other other Spanish city. And this is another, I mean, way of using this uh, this data, use relating uh, changes in bird behavior in space or in time with estimates of the abundance of predators or disturbance or whatever. And this gets to the question that Marianne was asking in the chat. Well, first okay. of all, how how long have you been doing the research on on uh, scaring birds, and what is the ultimate objective of the results. So once you learn these things, uh, mm -hmm. what what can be done with, with some of the results that'll come out of this project? Well, we, we have, um, the idea is, is to use this uh, large scale uh, databases to estimate how birds uh, can respond to changes, to global change drivers. I mean, uh, we have analyzed it in Europe because in Europe we have data of the last 15 years. We have, a, I started working in Madrid, for instance, in Toledo in 2010. So we have data for 12 year, year, years. But there are people in the team that started in the, in the 2006. So for some cities, we have replicated data for more than 20 years. Uh, we have explored the effects of uh, climate, climate change, and we have found also <clears throat> um, um, uh, clear cut response to, to changes in climate. Uh, as the climate is um, warming, birds need uh, less food, so they uh, are less forced, so fly initiation distance increase because they are not, <clears throat> they don't need to, to, to devote um, um, time to, to foraging because the, their physiological needs are, are, are smaller. So the idea behind this, this large scale database is that we can use how fly initiation distance vary in space and in time in response to global change drivers and estimate how bird population can respond to global change using these very simple measures. We have also found that there are clear uh, relationships between fly initiation distance and abundance of birds, and also uh, on fly initiation distance and population trends. 
So in, it is in much, some much easier. Yeah, sorry. It I is much say, easier. Yeah. Yeah. It's so much easier. Some... Yeah. Yeah, Travis, go, go. <laughs> yeah, so sorry. <laughs> We're gonna, it's a duet. We're duetting. Um, <laughs> so in some ways, you're documenting the effects of, in that instance, the cats, and that can lead to potentially policies or understanding the needs of how to manage for species, uh, native species in reserves and things like that. Hmm. Yeah, so some research groups all over the world are also using this flying decision distance to define buffer areas around reserves. I mean, uh, of course, uh, flying decision distance vary among species uh, more or less predictably. I mean, large birds are usually more scared than small birds, and um, and there's also association with race size, plume, well, there's lots of association that is. And yes, one idea is that if uh, endangered species are um, uh, more scared by people or by predators, we will need larger reserves for them uh, just to avoid these uh, this effects of scarring. Yes, this, this idea of buffer areas is especially uh, the Australian um, groups are, are using uh, this this uh, this data, this information for for this uh, for this kind of uh, approaches. But well, the idea of this uh, specific project is to use um, flying decision distal of common birds just to explore how birds in general will respond to uh, to change to to global change. But there are several other potential um, uh, uses of this information that, of course, we, we are working in a very collaborative uh, environment. I mean, if people like to address other questions with this data, we are open to develop these collaborations. Uh, well, what you just said, and maybe if you stop sharing your screen, uh, we'll both show up and people can turn their cameras on to ask questions if they'd like. Uh, what you just said about the size uh, relationship between size and um, flight initiation distance being that you can get closer to smaller species is consistent with what Paul uh, just put in the chat, saying it's funny seeing dark-eyed junco. Yeah. The ones in our, our yard in Culver City are practically tame and will let you approach quietly to within 10 feet or so. So is, is, this, is the size um, disturbance relationship are there any exceptions to that that you've found, or is it pretty much hummingbirds you can get really close and hawks you can't? Yeah, well, the, the idea of, of this invasion of urban habitats by birds is that if, if, if individual, individual birds that mm, are more chained in, 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 ur, in, in, urban area, in urban areas, the point is that they are predators are less abundant than outside. So for an individual bird that is more chained, this is an advantage because uh, uh, to invade an, uh, an urban site, you have to deal with people around. So if you are too scary, you cannot, you cannot, you, you, you don't have time to, to forage. Hmm? So this is, the, we think this is the, the, uh, the, the basis of this increased tameness of uh, birds that successfully invade cities. Hmm? Uh, and well, the case of uh, dark eyed jankos is a very clear cut uh, uh, case that they have been closely following by people in Los Angeles area. But we think that it can also explain the, the success of uh, other birds, such as the English sparrow or the, or the, or the pigeons. I mean, pigeons are, you, you know, are very, very tame and they are extremely abundant in cities around the world. That's interesting. Are you, are you interested in people looking at any particular species or, or not any particular group? So for example, are you interested in shorebirds? Um, or no, because they, they, are, they are rare inside cities. I mean, the idea is to okay. sample the natural communities of birds uh, that invade, or that, that, that are inside cities. I mean, um, if you, if you, I mean, the idea is, is to sample, 
everywhere. But well, I have sampled sorbets in in my Spanish cities because I mean they're. Uh, the Actitis bird, this species, the, um, uh, some sorbets enter cities, but they're quite rare. I mean, for this right. So, I mean, you can go to the beach in Los Angeles and get a, quite an interesting array of array of shorebirds, but you're more interested in ones that would be in the um, what we would call the urban forest. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, in parks. Uh, yeah, parks and the streets and that. Yeah, but anyway, uh, every every data is is important, is useful. I mean, right. The, the problem with with beaches is that it is not it's very very clear whether they are urban or not urban habitats. <laughs> right. So so it it is a bit tricky to to treat this this data. Right. I would prefer just just having lots of data on on juncos and on on and on uh, hummingbirds and and birds like that that just having good data on dolls or, or waders. Right. So you and and you, you can you can start in your yard, but you don't want to repeat sample. You want to go look other places. Yeah. Yeah. Right? It, 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 so it taking cool. different uh -huh. so that you're not measuring the same bird multiple times. Yeah, it is, this is important. This is important because yeah. um, uh, if we sample repeatedly the same bird, you are biasing the, the estimate. I mean, I've got some 40 records of birds just in the way from my home uh, in in uh, in Santa Monica Boulevard to the UCLA campus, and it is very very easy. I mean, it's and it, it is funny. You you are just uh, um, you are just just bird watching ac across the the city and the surroundings, just taking uh, some additional data on bird behavior. This is the idea. Right. Um, does anyone have questions? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, my two location, favorite locations are uh, Will Rogers State Historic Park and um, Culver City, where I live. Mm -hmm. So, um, from what was just said, um, what I might do would be to go around our area in Culver City or go up to Will Rogers, but not to keep reporting from Will Rogers. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It is, it's, it's just Do it record, mm -hmm, record the behavior in the areas you usually visit and if possible, just to uh, expand your, your, your sampling area uh, uh, around the city. But the idea is not to sample several times the same individuals, but just uh, move across the city. I have asked the, the I mean, yeah, I have a question. Um, you know, Los Angeles is a huge, huge city. It covers hmm. uh, hundreds of square miles with a fairly large non-urban areas. Uh, will, will these skew your results in any way? Hmm. Well, we can it's handle it. Well, it, it. Let's go. In, in Europe, we, have, we have sampled. Yeah. In, in Europe, we have sampled. For instance, I, I work in Toledo, that is a very, very small city, and in Madrid, that is a quite large one. Of course, you don't sample all the city. I mean, but this is just uh, uh, the city is is uh, is a way to organize your sample. Uh, with the application, the we have the opportunity of as we have all records are georeferenced, we can analyze uh, whether there are differences within the city if the city is very large. It's the case of Los Angeles. I, I expect differences. In, in behavior between birds sampling in Santa Monica and, 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 and Orange County. As, as I have found differences between records in Toledo and Madrid that are 70 kilometers. Uh, uh, well, I mean, I don't know what is the distance in miles. I mean, as we have the records georeferenced, we can ask whether there are differences within each city afterwards. 
But the idea is so, to get as many data as possible. Is it, is it just? Uh, so this is this is a big net. So you're not interested in limiting it to say the city limits of the city of Los Angeles. You're no, Santa Monica, no, no, no. Culver City, the LA yeah. area, and then you'll sort it out later. What you, mm -hmm, yeah. you know, and look for differences within that. And so so back to the question Tom asked, which I think was really insightful. We've got things like. Uh, you know, Griffith Park, um, which is a l very large urban, but rural. Uh, would, you, would you call that a rural setting or an urban setting? Or, or, I would or, say rural. OK. Rural. It, 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 for instance, in Madrid, there is a similar situation. There is a very large, we would call suburban park. I mean, it's, it's in the border of the city. And we use it. It's called the Casa de Campo. I mean, it's a it is not as large as the Griffith Park, because Madrid is not as large as Los Angeles, no? But it is, it is just the, the kind of rural area you find in very, very urbanized cities. I mean, uh, for instance, Toledo. Toledo is a small city, it's close to Madrid, and the surroundings are really rural. There are farmland, but around Madrid, you, you, you have to travel quite a lot to, to, to find farmland around the city. And I think it's the same situation in Los Angeles. Uh, farmland are located quite far away of the city because the, the city is so huge that has moved um, this farmland very, very outside. I, I, will, I will use for Los Angeles and maybe perhaps also for other large cities, uh, San Francisco or, or, or San Diego, uh, these large suburban parks as as the 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 rural control of uh, of the of the urban cities i mean instead of moving i mean a hundred kilometers away to find some some farmland i mean rural yeah. is um, a definition of uh, more or less um, is not truly natural hmm? But it is much less impacted by by human that usual human disturbance that that the the, the city call. I mean. And so you also mentioned that you had cities at different elevations that there was an altitude component, and yep. you know we have the ability here to go up into the mountains. Um, are you interested in people uh, going? up in altitude here in LA into the San Gabriel Mountains or are you really mostly focused on LA as being near sea level and so focusing on people in the the sea level or close to it hmm. uh, I, I will I will because the the altitudinal range in Los Angeles areas is is very short I mean I think it is much better to try to sample Los Angeles and cities in other Flagstad or Las Vegas, that is uh, another altitude, rather than trying to relate altitude within Los Angeles with beer behavior, because the altitude range will be too small. I mean, okay, uh, so it's uh, not as large as what matters for the things that yeah. you're looking for. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Do we have other questions? I, yeah, I noticed that you uh, sampled the very small uh, arboretum at UCLA, uh, close to uh, the hospital. Now, how did you characterize that in terms of type? The botanical Sorry. garden at UCLA, right? I, I should have said the botanical, the Mildred something botanical garden at UCLA. Mm -hmm. You sampled that. I noticed that in your data list. How did you characterize that? It, it would be urban. It, it, it would be urban. It would, it would, urban. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I took some samples also in the in, in the in the Eucla Garden. It is a, right. It is equivalent a, a small urban park because it is uh -huh. completely surrounded by by city areas. It's different than the situation with Griffith Park. Griffith are yeah. suburban. You know. And also in in Los Angeles, it it has surprised me because large parks inside the city are, are 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 more or less private. I mean, they are difficult to access. They are 
golf courses and, and stuff like that. Whereas in Europe, there are large parks inside the city that are clearly urban because there are plenty of people uh, um, almost every, every, every time, I mean. Uh -huh. It's okay. Yeah, uh, uh, for your volunteers, uh, are they expected to report on, uh, or how many field trips, how many uh, situations are you hoping that uh, each individual records? Hmm. Well, we need at least what well, for for because uh, according to our experience in other cities, we'll need around 400, 600 individual records per city. I mean, and that will be from uh, different individuals. This can be achieved by only one people sample the city, hmm? or by several people that are sampling in different areas of the city. Um, uh, for instance, I, in, in Madrid, I usually every year took uh, 1,000 records inside the city and 1,000 records around the city. Hmm? And it took me around 15 days during the breeding season. But this obviously depends on, on the abundance of birds. And, and I, I, I mean, it's just, at least 500 records inside and outside the city per breeding season, either by only one person or by a group of persons that are coordinated. I, I, I can coordinate people if you, if you ask me to. So to elaborate on that maybe a little, um, for individuals, is there a minimum number of observations that you'd want them to be interested in doing? Um, or would you take a whole bunch of people who do 10, you know? Yeah, I, I can I can handle, I mean, uh, for, for the project, um, uh, well, the idea is to, is to have data for at least six cities per country. And, and the idea is to, to, I mean, use all uh, the information that can, can be gathered. But uh, if, if um, I mean, if, if uh, people that ask to, to this uh, uh, call, uh, just sample two cities, I have to find people to sample other cities within the United States. I mean, and uh, for me, it's okay whether there is only one people in each country, in each city, I mean, or uh, if people are working in different cities. For instance, for Los Angeles, for me, it's okay if uh, 10 people sample the city. As far as we can more or less control uh, for double uh, records. I mean, if, if there are five people, five person that sample the botanical garden, we have to choose only one. <laughs> right, because... so you can you can do it afterwards. Yeah. You could take a bunch of I can, I can just... do afterwards, it's, yeah. it's very easy, I mean. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, Anne put something in the chat here. Anne, do you want to go ahead and ask a question regarding that or? It was kind of long and it might be counter to uh, Professor Diaz's conclusions. Um, so in, in summary, it's that like the conclusion so far is rural birds have more predators around them, so they're more alert and more likely to fly away when mm -hmm. we are approaching, right? Yeah. I, I, I was thinking about the source of food. So what I wrote in the chat is, in rural yeah. areas, they may be undeveloped. They may have more native plants that the local birds eat. So, you know, they might have a lot of food choices in the rural areas. Whereas mm -hmm. in where I live in Los Angeles, um, it's urban and people move in, people plant whatever they want, and it's not what the, what the native birds eat. So in an urban area like Los Angeles, where I live, um, a bird might have worked harder to, if, if a bird is foraging, uh, I don't know what percent of your observations are during foraging, but a bird might have worked harder to even find that plant 
and it might really not want to part with it because who knows where it will find the next plant that tastes good. Um, and so that might be another possible reason that uh, mm -hmm. it, it might not be a matter of whether it's afraid of the oncoming human, but it's how much it loves the plant and doesn't want to part with it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to measure that. And uh, I, I apologize, my, my thought is not very well formed. <laughs> well, it is clear that there are, there are many factors that can affect the behavior of every individual bird. For instance, we have, we, we have a paper in, using data uh, in, for European cities that the presence of feeders also uh, influences uh, the, the flying decision distance because if the source of food is predictable, birds can um, uh, um, are less forced to devote time to feeding because they, they can fly away and turn to back. So there is an effect of the availability of food. This is why we, we presented this flying decision distance as an integrated behavior uh, of birds. Well, as we cannot measure all the factors that are affected, they behavior of every individual bird, the only way is to sample as many birds in as many different circumstances as possible. And this, if we sample at random, makes that these all other influences cancel out. I mean, I, I don't know if I'm, 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 I'm I mean, if, you, if you're sampling birds in areas with plenty of food and less food and more predators and less predators, we are just mm, mixing all these effects. Hmm? Uh, so that if you, if I can take the mean behavior of many birds in Los Angeles and compare them with the mean behavior of many birds in San Diego, in Las Vegas, in Flagstad, in Mexico City, in um, San Jose de Costa Rica, Madrid, Paris, Beijing, this is the idea. Uh, the approach to try to understand the behavior of any individual bird, it's extremely difficult because there are plenty of, uh, of, of things that are influencing this uh, 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 particular behavior. We're trying to work with large means behavior in order to explore how birds in general are responding to global change, not every individual bird, because it is impossible. I mean, uh, hmm? This is, this is why we, we, we have to collect quite a lot of data by quite a lot of people and, and, and analyze the, the whole data rather than either, every individual record. I have explained my, myself. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 so you do, I forget what you, whether you said, you do record what the bird is doing when you start, right? Whether they're not really, free, no. not really, okay. Well, the idea is to avoid situation that clearly bias the result. If the bird is, if the bird is in their nest, they probably will, will have much yeah. shorter fly initiation distance that they, they, he is foraging. I mean, it is doing normal activities, maybe foraging or preening or singing, it's okay. But if the, it is nesting or, or, or feeding a chick, obviously this, this is another thing. I mean, the, the, this, the, the, the flying decision distance doesn't reflect the state of the bird, but they are forced to do things that retain it in a, in a given place. Yeah, right. Well, I want to thank you uh, for getting up in the middle of the night to, to talk to us. If, <laughs> if while we finish up here, if you can type your email in the chat, uh, and, and I have it as well, and I can communicate uh, updates about this out to the mailing list. Um, but in case people are interested and want to follow up, um, they'll have your, your email directly here. Um, and it's the kind of thing, I think, where, uh, you take a lot of people who are interested. Um, maybe there'll be a few who want to do a lot, and and a lot who want to do a few. Uh, it's that kind of a that kind of a project. Um, but but all of it can go into this 
central database. And I also appreciate sort of sharing behind the curtain how a project comes together, uh, that we learn these things that are going toward uh, global conservation questions of, you know, birds and cities and, and the stresses on them, and ultimately then the policies that we need to, uh, to protect them and keep them along with us uh, as we head into this ever human uh, dominated uh, landscape and world. And world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you're not interested in shorebirds, but next month um, for our program, we're going to have Tom Ryan, who's worked with us for many years on shorebirds, and mm -hmm. he's going to talk a little bit about the work and some of the community science as well uh, around uh, California least turn, maybe a little bit of snowy plover. Um, and I'm working on getting that uh, announced and out to everybody. So put it on your schedule for the second, uh, the second Wednesday in February, uh, and we'll, we'll go to the beach virtually. Um, and some, some urban-ish uh, locations, <laughs> uh, urban adjacent uh, beach locations. So thank you again, Mario, for, for coming and, and all of you for, for your interest in this topic. And uh, we'll see you uh, again next month. Um, Travis? And, yep. Um, leased sandpipers um, in Bayona Creek a, f a few days ago. That was fun. Oh. 30 of them. Very cool. Leased sandpipers. All right.